What a joy it is to be back with you this morning after our vacation and to be able to share in worship with you. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, prepare our hearts now to hear your word read and proclaimed. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with that same spirit. That as we hear your word read and hear it proclaimed, we may receive what it is that you would want to say to us today to challenge us, to correct us, to encourage us in our walk with Christ. All this we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is found in the seventh chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. uh, Selected verses, we will begin with verses 1 through 5 and then continue with verses 15 through 16. Jesus said, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your, own, in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Then continuing, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this is the time of year when a lot of people are taking vacations, and one of the most popular places for people to visit on their vacations here on the East Coast is Disney World, and out on the West Coast is Disneyland. Walt Disney, of course, was one of the most innovative, creative, and futuristic thinkers that America has ever produced. And something you may not know is that Disney became interested in his later years in in the subject of cryonics, the intriguing idea that our human bodies could be cryogenically frozen and then thawed out later in the future. Imagine, for example, the possibility of being diagnosed with a terminal illness for which there is no known cure, but then being frozen. And then in the future, after a cure has been discovered, by your body thawed out and, and the cure administered. And so it came as no surprise to those who knew him that when Walt Disney was diagnosed with lung cancer back in 1966, that he chose to be cryogenically frozen with the hope that he would one day be thawed out and cured of cancer. And so one of the most frequently visited attractions at Disneyland out in California is the deep freeze chamber located directly beneath the Pirates of the Caribbean ride where Disney's cryogenically frozen corpse awaits the day when medical science has found a cure for cancer and Uncle Walt can be brought back to life once again. I wonder how many of you here have visited that cryogenic chamber out at Disneyland. Anybody here? Well, that's probably not a surprise because it's not true. The fact of the matter is that Disney's remains were cremated on December 17, 1966, and his ashes interred at the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. But the myth of Disney's body being cryogenically frozen and resting beneath the Pirates of the Caribbean ride is just one of the many myths and and urban legends that continue to circulate on the Internet. Well, today we're going to be wrapping up our summer sermon series called Mythbusters Church Edition as we explore one of the popular spiritual myths that even many smart, sincere, faith-filled Christians have come to believe. And today's spiritual myth is this, Christians shouldn't judge. Christians shouldn't judge. That's true, isn't it? Isn't that what 
Most of us have been taught as we have grown up in the Christian faith that Christians shouldn't judge. In fact, Matthew 7 says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus himself said those words. One surefire way to get your non-Christian friends or co-workers to start quoting the Bible, in fact, is to call something a sin. Speak out against a lifestyle that the Bible forbids or critique the belief systems of a cult or world religion or criticize any behavior that's not universally condemned by our culture and then sit back and wait for just a moment. And it won't be long before someone who otherwise has little or no use for the Bible begins to quote from Matthew 7, 1, do not judge. But the idea that Jesus commanded his followers uh, to judge, uh, not to judge, is a myth or at best a half-truth. And it is yet another widely believed spiritual myth. Refusing to make judgments or to call sin, sin, is not what Jesus asks us to do. If we will read the Bible carefully, what we will discover is that Jesus did it all the time. And he asks and encourages us to do the same. In our text for today, Jesus says, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. And we love this passage because it seems to support our modern understanding of tolerance. Of course, tolerance, when defined as living peaceably alongside our neighbors who happen not to share our Christian beliefs and values, is unquestionably a good thing. And frankly, it would help if we would also learn to live a bit more peaceably alongside our Christian brothers and sisters who sometimes see things differently than we do. But many today would go beyond living peaceably alongside our neighbors, whether Christian or non-Christian, to define tolerance as affirming that everyone is equally right, no matter what they believe or do. Today, tolerance is often defined as allowing others to believe and live in ways that we don't agree with, supporting their right to do it, and then this, refusing to judge their viewpoint or actions as being either right or, or wrong. And so whenever someone dares to suggest that a particular way of believing or living is better than another, we are quick to remind them of what? Jesus said, do not judge. And that's a conversation stopper, isn't it? Who are you to tell me what is right and wrong, we say? Who are you to hold me accountable? After all, Jesus said, do not judge. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus did not forbid us from making judgments about sin any more than he refused to make judgments about sin. He judged the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. He judged the money changers who had transformed the temple from a house of prayer into a den of robbers. And then he told us not to cast pearls before swine or to follow false prophets who come among God's people as wolves in sheep's clothing. Both of those things are pretty hard to do without making some moral and spiritual judgments about who are the swine and, and who are the false prophets. In the story of the woman caught in adultery, which we heard earlier this morning, Jesus not only teaches us that it is okay to judge, but he demonstrates for us how to judge. And just as importantly, how not to judge. We can picture the angry, self-righteous mob of people dragging this woman caught in adultery through the dusty streets and then throwing her down at the feet of Jesus. No word about the man with whom she had been caught. That's another sermon. But this mob wants justice, and they want biblical justice. But Jesus breaks through their self-righteousness as he says to her accusers, let he who is without sin throw the first stone. 
here we find the first key to how we should judge. In our text for today, Jesus says, Before you try to remove the speck from your neighbor's eye, remove the log from your own. It's a pretty humorous image when you stop to think about it for just a moment. But the message is clear. Before we start judging other people, we need to first look at our own hearts. Are we without sin? Are our motives pure in judging another? Could it be that it is our own weakness in a particular area that causes us to notice that same weakness in others and call it out? Or are we simply trying to let God know that in spite of our many sins and weaknesses, we're on his side? Have you ever noticed how those, some of those who have been the loudest and most vocal in judging certain sins were later to have been discovered struggling with those same sins? We're reminded, for example, of Jimmy Swaggart, the Pentecostal pastor and televangelist whose broadcasts were once distributed over 3,000 TV stations and cable systems every week but whose sexual scandals in the late 1980s and 1990s led the Assemblies of God to revoke his ordination and caused him to have to step down as the head of Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. Friends, some of us are struggling with secret sins of our own, and our sense of guilt causes us to point out the sins of others, hoping that no one will notice our own. Jesus says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And when no one casts that first stone, the woman's accusers begin to slink away. Jesus then turns to the woman and asks, has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she replies. Neither do I condemn you, says Jesus. Now, many people think that the story ends there, but it doesn't. It continues. Jesus then says, go and sin no more. Jesus doesn't condemn the woman caught in adultery, but he does judge her. He judges her conduct to have been sinful and commands her to go and sin no more. But unlike her accusers, Jesus judges her with grace. He offers her a chance for a fresh start and a new beginning, which would not have been possible had he not first named her sin. Judgment and grace are two sides of the same coin. There can be no grace without judgment, and there should be no judgment without grace. In this story, Jesus teaches us that it is okay to judge, but first we must examine our own hearts, and second, we must make sure that our judgments are accompanied by grace. We as Christians are called to hold one another accountable, to speak the truth in love is the way the Scripture says it, and to practice both judgment and grace. It is, in fact, an act of love to correct a brother or sister in Christ if done so in a spirit of grace and humility. Have you ever noticed how we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt when we judge ourselves? We cut ourselves some slack, don't we? We put our conduct in the very best possible light. And we assume that our motivation was right, even if what we did happened to be wrong. And so the question we need to ask ourselves, do we do that when we judge others? Do we put their conduct in the best possible light? Do we give them the benefit of the doubt? Do we cut them some slack? God wants us to judge in the same way that we both judge and love ourselves in a spirit of grace 
and humility. If we read the entirety of what Jesus says in Matthew 7, we hear Jesus say, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Some of us may interpret this to mean that if we don't judge anybody, then God won't judge us. We wish. But Jesus is cautioning us about being judgmental, of judging without grace. For if we judge others without grace, God may be inclined to do the same when he judges us. One of the problems we have as Christians is when we attempt to hold non-Christians accountable to our Christian values. Let me ask you this, why would a non-Christian share our Christian values? Our Christian values are the byproduct of our faith and of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They are, in fact, a reflection of our desire to live in a way that honors and glorifies God because of our relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. Why should it surprise us that our non-Christian friends don't see the necessity of doing that? But remember this, Christianity did not grow up in a Christian world. It began in a pagan world. And so the first Christians didn't waste their time judging their pagan neighbors by their Christian values. Instead, they focused their time and energy on how they could live themselves as faithful followers of Jesus Christ in a pagan world. And then they looked for opportunities to share their faith with those who were open and receptive.